Um, usually I'm introducing the speaker, but today I am the speaker, so I will introduce myself and, um, and speak. Um, and I'm very excited you're all here. This is the first time we're kind of doing this talk, and if we feel it's good and useful, we might do it again and on a maybe somewhat regular basis, because people are diagnosed on a somewhat irregular basis, so we may have to do it um, kind of on and off every so often. Um, I have a daughter with type 1 diabetes. She was diagnosed six years ago, and she is now 15. And when this starts, thank you. <laughs> um, I'll have a picture of her. Um, and this talk is really all about how to wrap your head and get started with type 1 diabetes. And I apologize, someone thought it was about um, traveling with type 1 diabetes. So if anyone else thought it was about traveling with diabetes, it's not, but I'm happy to talk about that. And since we're a very small group, I'm really happy to talk about anything. But um, I will start with my disclaimer. So that's my daughter, Tia, and this doesn't look like it's in focus. Um, I'm the, the younger one of the two um, over here. Um, and that's from a few years ago. And uh, as I said, she was diagnosed in 2009. And I started CarbDM, this nonprofit, in 2010 when we realized that what people with type 1 diabetes need, or what we needed, and therefore we decided everybody needed, was for people to come together and learn from other people with type 1 diabetes. Because the true experts in living with type 1 diabetes are other people who are living with type 1 diabetes. And I'm fortunate to have my friend Melissa here, who's on the board of CarbDM, and she's, we met her soon after her daughter Katie was diagnosed, and we brought her on board and then literally brought her on board to the board of CarbDM. Um, and the other person here who works for CarbDM is Anna Picasso. She's our um, blogger and social media person and she'll be recording the talk and stuff. If anyone's uncomfortable with any of their questions being recorded, we can always stop it and certainly not include it, so just let us know. Um, so, I don't know, since you're all mostly new to type 1 diabetes, I don't know how much you know about CarbDM, but CarbDM provides programs and ongoing education for people who have had diabetes, whether it's for 40 years or four months or four weeks, and both for uh, young children with type 1 diabetes to adults with type 1 diabetes. And we have programs for adults called Beer and Basil, as well as many of our speakers are relevant uh, to adults as well as to parents of children with type 1 diabetes. And we like to think that our family programs, Carbs in the Park, are relevant to both adults who um, can come to them with their families as well as to parents of children with type 1 diabetes because I always say that for parents of children with type 1 diabetes to meet adults who are living with type 1 diabetes and living well with type 1 diabetes, that's to see their children's future and that's what gives us hope. Um, so, and our children hopefully will be healthy and happy adults and that's what we strive for, so we encourage adults to come to all of our programs. Um, so here's my disclaimers, and if I was getting money from any company, I would also have to report that here. I don't get money from any company, so I'm not reporting any of that. But I'm a mom. I'm not a medical professional. If you ask me any question that is, you know, a, a medical question, I can tell you what I do. I can not tell you what, that that's what you should do for your child, and I can suggest that you speak to your doctor about that but this is not meant to provide medical advice. Um, the other thing I will tell you is that after living with type 1 diabetes for six years, there's a lot I don't know. So I think um, the more you live with it, the more you realize how much you don't know about type 1 diabetes, and the more humbled I am by it every day, and every night too, <laughs> I'll tell you that. And the other thing I will say, and this is sort of uh, one of my pet peeves about diabetes, is that you cannot control diabetes, and anyone who speaks to you in the terms of controlling diabetes, um, either you should correct them or find another person to talk to about it. We all try to manage diabetes, but we can't control it, and that's something we should all let go of with a communal sigh of relief. Um, so that's my disclaimer. Um, and today I'm really going to talk about three kind of big areas of getting started with diabetes. It's um, getting organized, getting the information that's right for you at the right time and from the right people, and then getting the support. And to me, that's the essentials of getting started with diabetes and living with it, um, certainly within the first year. And then going forward, you can start then decide what's your um, balance of these things, how much of each you need in your life. Um, and if something is this, of this is like, oh God, we're, we're past it, and I kind of know how long, 
how long each of you have been living and where you are and somewhat the process of living with diabetes, we can skip through them more quickly. Um, so the third, first thing is everyone realizes as soon as they have diabetes, that then, like a friend said to me when my daughter was diagnosed, well, it's like walking around with a backpack for the rest of your life. And she didn't just mean that figuratively, she meant it literally, because now everyone walks around with a pack, or deep packs, or insulin packs, or whatever you call it. And there's a lot of options from the very boring and mundane to the, you know, you can choose something more exciting. Um, but the idea is choose a pack you like, choose a pack your child likes, and then change it. Um, Melissa was just saying that her daughter likes, you know, to change it up when it comes to low supplies. I get my daughter a new pack probably every day of birthday. Uh, we celebrate my daughter's anniversary of her diagnosis. Um, I can tell you the reasons for that, and you can think it's crazy or not. But on her day of birthday, I usually get a new pack. And if she wants a new one during the year, I will get her a new pack during the year because she has to carry it around all the time, and it's an accessory, and it's all about the accessory. So change it up, get something they like, and keep it, keep them happy with it because you want them to enjoy carrying that thing around all the time. And I know it can be harder for boys because boys don't like carrying packs around. I mean, my daughter doesn't either, but Brett Michaels is now making, um, Brett Michaels from Poison, I think is, he makes packs now that should appeal to boys. And I should add that this comes with a long handout that I will email to you because my printer wasn't working. So I will email my handout to all of you and has a lot of these things in it. Do you um, like something uh, in particular? Your daughter? Do you um, something? Because we're trying to know too and we didn't like that. Really? So this one is by Amerabag and it's the first one we got. We got it at like footwear, etc. And it was amazing because it had pockets and things and it was like perfect for diabetes. To the point that we now have them and I can't use them just as an evening bag. To me it looks like a diabetes bag. But it has perfect little compartments for everything. What did you buy? At footwear, etc. But Amazon or eBags is a great place. It's by Amira Bag, and I can't remember the name of it, but I can give it to you. She's now using this bag. Uh, it's by Overland Equipment, I think it's called. Um, it also has lots of nice compartments, and when she started carrying a phone, she needed that one didn't have enough, and the extra pocket for the phone. Okay. I know a lot of boys like these by Manhattan Bags. My son has a sling one that goes to and he, for some reason, he loves the bag, so I'm good. <laughs> You're not, you know, that's a I'm, very, I'm, very I'm thing. Excited. So, but, you know. Uh, what, what's in so it? Bag and what was the this bag? one's a Mara bag, and these two are Overland equipment. And Overland has a lot of different bags. Tia likes a specific one. We have a friend who has another Overland, but, you know, okay. I'm happy to send you the exact name. It may also be in that handout. Okay. Um, but it's got a lot of little pockets and... Our first two bags were lace sack. Do you remember the oh, brand yeah. lace sack? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And why got it, they have cute little patterns and so okay. we, we have gone through several. Yeah. And now Katie wants to carry a, a black leather purse. Oh, wow. Oh, nice. So that's what she now has a purse. Okay. So. Yeah, and Tia doesn't want anything to look too much like a purse. So you just have to find what's right for your kid. And, and it'll change. And change it. Okay. But you know, think of it not as, oh, and then this, I don't think you can see it here but as well, but it's um, it's a type one mom developed it. It's called Out of Sight. And it's like, it's this pack and you can um, Velcro it or attach it to your belt. It's probably too big for a little kid, but it's got cool things. And then the other thing I just found, I think it's called a grid and it's meant to carry, it's got, it's just this big, flat kind of cardboardy thing, but it's wrapped with like black cordova, and it's got um, elastic, Sections. what? Sections. It's just, no, it's just like elastic, wolf, you know, like woven, and it's meant to carry all your cables and stuff, but it's really cool way to carry your diabetes supplies, and I saw, and you can just like throw it in, again, if you're carrying a messenger bag or something like that, it just, and it's flat, so all your stuff is right there in front of you. So I got one of those for my daughter, and I saw some, you know, woman carrying it, but it's all laid right there in front of you. So, you know, there's a lot of options, but try to think of it creatively, not as just like, oh, here's your bright red bag, you know, that says medical supply on it, and go carry that on the playground, Johnny. No one's gonna wanna carry that. So think of it creatively, and think of it as something, a fun accessory. I always say diabetes is all about the accessories. Like Nathan and Sharon's son is getting a pump, and he's all excited because it's blue. 
And, you know, if someone wants a pink pump, I always say, if you want a pink pump, there's one option. Yeah. So if it's the color's important, that's what you go with. So choose a pack, and then the supply list. We all know the supply list goes on forever, right? That's the mess of it. That's just the start. So you want a meter, you want lots of meters, you want your pricker, and remember, the pricker that comes with the meter is not the pricker you have to use. So a lot of people get a meter and a pricker, and they think, okay, they come together. They're not attached. So my daughter uses this multiplex, which is on the left, and I don't know why my, uh, probably because I'm out of battery. But this is a multiplex. It actually has a barrel in it with six um, lancets. Um, so you don't have any sharps to dispose of. Um, and it's really convenient, and she likes it the best. So we have lots How of How does it come out? Is it a cartridge that they stay, that the, the pokers stick in there? Stay yeah, in? it's a cartridge with six. With six? Boxes. And then yeah. so it comes out with when the six. When it comes out, it's there. just this little plastic thing that comes out, and there's no sharp edges. Okay. This so this is the cartridge. Right there. And um, you, you change the lancet by turning this little and you cock it, and uh -huh. then you put your finger next to it. And sure. Okay. And then, but then I it don't even. Out. It pulls out. Yeah. Um, and I throw them in the garbage. And, and the you trash. Don't need yeah. To sharks because it's in, in closed. Okay. They. My daughter says these hurt the least. Right. My daughter also says they hurt the least, but it's also very convenient. Um, they don't sell those now. They sell the fast clicks. Because but just we have that, the other one. The, the Delica, Delica, right. Yeah. But just remember that just because it came with your meter, that doesn't mean you have to use that Lancet. So shop around for the Lancet device that works best for you. Um, and also remember, just because they tell you you have to change a Lancet every time you check, you don't really have to do that. Some people change it once a day, some people change it once a week, some people change it once a month, and some people change it once a year. So really- Because it's on themselves. Right? Yeah. yeah. And it's up to them. And the other thing is, doctors will tell you you need to use alcohol, and you don't. That I won't say. Because it, actually, our diabetes educator told us not to use alcohol. It dries out your fingers. So you just wash your hands, though, right? Or That's one way. My daughter licks her finger. Licks. <laughs> there are liquors, and there are non liquors. Because we were at a party, and he was high, and then, but it was weird because he's not high right now at all. Then and he, he had the ketchup hands. on his hands, so that's why he was yeah, high. Yeah. And then he yeah. checked again, then he was like, right. the what we're used to, the numbers. Right. So I was like, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And again, strips, yeah. strips, you have to use the strips that go with your meter, obviously. Um, syringes are one option, um, glucose tabs or any low supplies, and then of course a glucagon kit. Um, but that's kind of the basics, an insulin delivery device, low supplies and a glucagon kit. Um, I know a lot of adults don't get talked to about glucagon kits, but ask your doctors about glucagon kits if they haven't mentioned it to you. Um, and hopefully they will come out with a better delivery device for glucagon. We're all hoping for that, like a gluco pen kind of thing. Like but an EpiPen kind of thing. An EpiPen, but yeah. So and you don't have to use the you don't have to use the needle that comes with the glucagon if you ever have to I've never right. had to use it in three and a half years. Um, and T has not used glucagon. Not in not an emergency. In an emergency kind of thing. Um, but you can use a regular syringe. You may have to do multiple shots um, of the substance, and that might be, in, in an emergency, that might be stressful. But you don't have to use the big honk of needle that comes Oh, okay. Right. A lot of people take the glucagon kit and tie a sur and rubber band a syringe to it so that they've got a syringe at the ready so that they don't have to use the, you know, you use it to mix it, but then they actually draw it with the regular syringe. Um, and for a lot of kids, you actually aren't using the whole amount. Your doctor will tell you how much your kid actually needs in the case of emergency, and then an insulin syringe might be enough. For an adult, you usually do need the whole amount, but still, you could use the syringe two times. Just make sure whoever is, you know, your emergency person knows how to use it. Um, and of course, stop me at any time if you have questions. They're going to sit here all night and decide if they're going to stay or go. Yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. And then whatever insulin you want to use. When you're done, we'll go. We'll go. Okay, that's okay. Um, and then, of course, the insulin, and everyone's on their own insulin, and that's fine. But don't forget your insulin. Um, so, 
and then those supplies, and then, and, you know, I'm sure everyone was given, you know, here's your juice boxes and your, your glucose tabs, right? So my daughter will not carry um, juice boxes because they're heavy, and she doesn't want to be carrying that around, and she only likes juice if it's cold, and, you know, under very special circumstances will she drink juice. Um, does everyone know about iHeartGuts? No. iHeartGuts is um, a company that makes um, body plush body parts, and they're very cute, and they have a very cute plush pancreas. So that was one of the things we gave Tia for her first die of birthday, and we used to give to every newly diagnosed. Um, if you see, it's already good you stayed this long. Um, <laughs> and it actually comes with a little explanation of what a pancreas does. Yes, there's pads of paper back here and pens if anyone wants to take notes. Um, that's the tag that comes with it, give me some sugar. Um, and then they also have lots of other body parts, so if you have friends who are going through other medical conditions, you can get them mammary glands and all kinds of livers <laughs> and Heart. livers and They make and stickers too. They do, and pins and all kinds of, and, and t-shirts and really cute stuff, but their plush pancreas is especially cute. And, um, so yeah, so, um, and it's iheartguts.com. So, um, again, be creative with your low supplies. Anything with sugar will serve to bring up a low, right? So for a while, my daughter was having sugar cubes and she carried sugar cubes. Big Tic Tac containers, you know, the bigger ones that come with like 200 Tic Tacs are great containers for things like sugar cubes once the Tic Tacs are gone. So she would use those for sugar cubes. Um, jelly beans. Jelly beans are these the sports beans? Yeah, I think sports beans or something. Um, those actually don't have um, food coloring and stuff in them, and they have some electrolytes, so we like to think of them as a little better. Uh, but, yeah. you know, but again, they have the carbs you need, and they will bring you up, and they're not glucose tabs or juice boxes. Um, this is another thing she ate, is boot chomps. Again, they're electrolytes and stuff like that. She liked them better than um, things. Juice. Oh, honey sticks. Honey, honey sticks. sticks. The it's kind you get at. Um, I mean, you have to add five. Well, they're four or five grams for little ki kids. It's the same as a glucose yeah. tab. It's the same as a glucose tab. So, you know, um, Skittles. They're the classic. The fun size that you get during Halloween. They're 15 grams of carbs. If that's too much for your kid. These are cool yes. too. The gels. The gels. Those are a lot usually for that? kids because it's 20 or 25 grams. But for an adult, yeah. that would work well. Um, yeah. Marshmallows. My daughter loved mini marshmallows for a long time. And they were very easy to feed her at night. Because she could kind of chew them at night. For the little ones, it's half a gram. Um, for a regular marshmallow, it's about six grams. So, again, be creative and know that you're going to have to change it. Just when you stack up on butterscotch uh, candies and you put it on, you know, uh, automatic delivery from Amazon, they switch. But, right, so for again, for my daughter, it's been butterscotch candies for a long time, and then she switches. But just think out of the sort of diabetes box when it comes to low supplies and switch it up all the time. What's Katie been having lately? She does always does a mix um, uh, glucose tabs, uh, juice. She drinks a lot of juice because she swims, and that's easy to drink while she's in the pool. Um, and um, and then gummies, and she does some of the um, some of the elevate. She's used oh. elevate and and level the level gels. She does she get those. a lot? She, does she get low a lot when she's swimming? Um, she can, and sometimes she goes high. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. The so, funny thing about glucose tabs, my daughter goes to high school with twins that are. Uh, family friends and they pull out their glucose tabs and every, all the kids want them. Oh, they, think, they think it's like a thing. Big, um, yeah, they, they love them. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. my daughter had the packs of Smarties yeah. for, you know, we have a ton of those because she wanted them. Um, Elevate 15 is a powder that was, again, uh, developed by a type 1 mom. It's 15 grams of carbs. It comes in a pack and it's a powder you, throw, you just throw on your tongue and some people like that a lot and it's easy to carry around. It's just a little envelope so it's easy to carry and it's flat. So it's flat. Yeah. Back, back pocket. Back pocket. Which is really nice. My daughter carries that. She has a service dog and the service dog has, um, you know, in the vest has some pockets so she puts some in there. You know, so she carries that around that way. Um, 
level is also kind of a gel that has, I think, 10 grams of carbs. 15. Oh, it is 15? And they're, you know, vanilla, butterscotch, Scotch. Yeah. Um, mandarin. Orange or something. Yeah. yeah. So, again, be creative, switch it up, keep it fresh. You're, my daughter never liked glucose tabs, and at camp they only give orange, which is apparently the worst. Like, you know, every year in her review of camp, it's like, stop with the orange glucose tabs. Stop with the orange. Stop. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> so, anything in the candy aisle I can hear the teenagers saying that. Um, on to the insulin delivery devices. We are very lucky that these aren't our options anymore. These are um, the original syringes that were once in a history museum, are in a history museum. We didn't get to go see the exhibit, but we are lucky that those are not our insulin delivery devices. Um, there's pens, and a lot of people like pens, and I don't know how many of you have gone from syringes to pens before maybe moving on to something else, but pens are easy to dial in the numbers. Um, they're discreet, they kind of look like a pen, they look like an EpiPen, um, they're easy to carry, and certainly easier than trying to do that in the middle of the night or any time, for those of us whose eyes aren't what they used to be. Um, you know, Syringes, I'm sure everyone's familiar with, so I don't need to think. This is the first pump. That is really what the first pump looked like. Luckily, no one ever really carried it. Um, but now we have lots of different pump options. And there's actually more, but they're not the kind that anyone really uses. But there's you know, at least six different pumps on the market. Um, is anyone here using pens? Everyone goes on. Oh, you are using pens? So you went from syringes to pens? Never. 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 Oh, you never use syringes? Oh, interesting. Okay. We talked about it actually two days ago. Um, the doctor was suggesting it. We never asked for it. My son has no issue with the syringes. So if it's not broke, let's not fix it. So we're going to the pump. He doesn't mind syringes at all. Huh. And you never went on syringes. They were. We were getting those in Florida. Florida difference between a syringe and a pen because it's a needle going in, right? I mean, yes, it's easier to do that. But to so many people, a pen is so much more oh, friendlier. Yeah, but because, because it's, it's ready, the, right. the cartridge is ready, you just right. dial whatever you need and you press and that's it and you don't need to pull and right. push and get the, the bubbles out yes. or whatever it is Well, Maureen had two days of syringe in uh, um, the hospital. Oh, yeah. Right. In the hospital, she sure. hated that. She, she hated said, the syringes. She said no more. Right, but to me, for the person getting it, to me, a syringe and a pen is the same in my mind, but to so many people, it's totally different. Well, and if you're very skinny and you don't put syringes, I think they also use syringes with the bit. Oh, yeah. longer needles. Yeah, longer needles. Right, she's very tiny. Yeah. So pens typically have to be kept in, in longer. longer. So yeah. some people don't like them because. Right. They have to be kept in longer, and they leak. Right. So yeah, um, my son heard about that, and he's like, "No, then." So the yeah. leaking, I always think it's misleading. It's like, and a lot of parents of young kids like the ping because it has a remote. Um, the Vibe now has the Dexcom continuous glucose monitor integrated into it. That's what I'm hoping to go on, but Kaiser won't cover a CGM for unless you have, you know, unexplained lows. So we'll yeah. see financially what I can do. Um, and then there's the Omnipod, which is a, cool. a tubeless pump, so it's a patch pump. It kind of goes on with you, goes on you, and all the insulin is in the pod. So there's no, you're not attached to the pump okay. in one place, and then the Actually, pump carrying via tube carrying the um, sure, sure. insulin. So a lot of people like that who don't like to feel that connected and wires and stuff like that. And it's waterproof, and you mm -hmm. keep it on when you're. This little thing is the Omnipod. Are the other and ones not waterproof? You have to disconnect. You disconnect. For a shower or yeah. swimming. Yeah. But the Omnipod's fairly thick. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. But I know a lot of people with really active kids. Um, like it's it. smaller than the T-Slim, but it goes on yeah. your skin. skin. Yeah. It's attached to you. It's larger than the Yeah. And the smaller ones are more. My daughter always thought it's, that it was too big for her to have on her body. But and there's a lot of teeny little kids who have it on their body because again they can't pull at it. There's no, they can't press any buttons accidentally. So, you know, it's again, it's whatever works for the kid and the parents. But 
there, when my daughter was looking at a pump, the T-Slim was even, the Omnipod was even bigger. Now it's smaller, but she still feels that it's too big to have such a big, you know, it's like half an egg on your body yeah. or even a little bigger all the time because it carries 200 units of insulin. And then you manage it from what's called a personal diabetes um, manager or something, which is your, your meter and your, you know, the pump basically, mm -hmm. the brains. Um, and there's pros and cons to every pump. And I always say, if you want a waterproof pump, you have one option. If you want a tubeless pump, you have one option. If you want a pink pump, you have one option. You know, it's like, if, if at the end, they'll all deliver insulin in a very efficient, you know, probably more comfortable way for your child than syringes or pens. Um, and it all comes down to the, the different features and what you want. If you want a touch screen pump, you have one option. If you want a pump with a remote, you have one option. If you want a pump with an integrated CGM with low threshold suspense, you have one option. So you kind of have to choose which features are more important to you, and based on that, you choose your pump. Um, and sometimes it does come down to something as to, to us as esoteric as the color of the pump. But again, they're the ones wearing it all the time, sure. and if it, they care that it's blue or pink or purple, you go with that, because right. none of the pumps are bad. Right. So you go with it. Did you have a question? So, yeah, um, and then the Dexcom is a continuous glucose monitor. Is everyone familiar with CGMs? So, again, Medtronic has an integrated CGM. Dexcom is working with all the other companies that are represented here, the Snap Pump. The Animus Vibe has the Dexcom integrated with it. T-Slim, Omnipod, and Snap will all have the Dexcom integrated with it. Eventually. Eventually. What is Snap? SNAP is a pump that currently is not uh, approved for under, I think, 21. So you probably didn't even hear about it. Um, it's actually a pump that uses a pen cartridge for their um, reservoir. So you talk about not having to fill or anything. You take a pen cartridge, you put it in, connect your tubing, and basically you're good to go. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> right now it only works with Cumalog, and they're developing one that works with Novolog, and um, you can, one of the cute things about it, I just did this last night, you can customize the color of this, and you can color, customize the color of the background, and some pattern, and this black thing in the back, that with the cartridge, that gets thrown out every week, and you put in a new, the whole back with the cartridge gets a new one put on every uh, week, um, and the interface is pretty straightforward, like one of the things they tried to do is really simplify the user interface versus all the other pumps. And one of the coolest things about it, it has a flashlight, which is brilliant if you think about it. <laughs> so all of us trying to fumble around at night to, you know, pull this or whatever we try to do, it has a flashlight. Um, and yeah, all of them will be integrated eventually with the Dexcom CGM. So that's really nice. So we're very grateful that we have all these options. Do you have a question? Or are you still trying to decide? No, I'm, I'm trying to understand why the FDA doesn't approve things for kids. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the t is approved for 12 and under, 12 and over. Omnipod, I think, is approved for pediatrics. Vibe, I don't well, know. the t you can get the Right, exception. you can get. So. Everything you can get. But I'm just saying, just look at this thing. This is approved for 16 and older. Um, the Vibe, I think, is probably also not approved for pediatrics yet, is my guess. I don't know for, I sure. I don't know for sure. Because the nothing's. Was, but not the Vibe. Right. Um, this probably is. Snap is 21. They're working on it. And T Slim is 12. And Dexcom has a pediatric version and an adult version. So the adult version actually has different algorithms than the pediatric one. Okay. We have the FDA to thank for all of that. They're so they're much better than these. Yeah, they're much better. And the, the requirement is that they have to do studies. And, the, and they're incredibly, uh, though they're willing to do studies on adults um, in a much uh, less restricted way. And so it has to be used first by adults. In every study that's done in pediatrics, they have to do a, an adult study and then incrementally go down in age. And it's a huge, huge, huge cost. Like huge. something like $10 million for each submission. I recently learned that the different color pumps from Medtronic, each of them had to separately be submitted to the FDA so because, because of the color. You don't know what psychological <laughs> uh, 
trauma it that the actually, kids will get. It was I actually mean, whether or not you have to have some some jack from the government tell you. It was, to, it was to know whether or not the plastic that could, was, would it could just, the same. Just pet his head. A <laughs> I remember, though, the pink came out just as my daughter was getting a pump, and the breath came all excited to show me the pink. And no offense to those who like pink, but it's Pepto-Bismol pink. And he was like, this, the pink came out. And I was like, and so? I mean, my daughter is such not a pink girl. Yeah. But we have many friends who love the pink, and we love them. Um, yeah, so... Here's a plug for participating in studies, whether you're an adult or have a child with type one. Participating in studies is A, fun, B, can be very lucrative, some of them pay very well, and B, you are contributing to the community and to science. My daughter has participated in multiple studies with many of these devices, the T-Slim, the Dexcom, the Medtronic. Um, you know, she was part of the study that got the FDA approval for the Dexcom G4, and that's, you know, she loved knowing that she was part of that. So there are study opportunities. Uh, a lot of them are right here through Stanford. Um, they do a lot of the technology studies, both for research and for FDA approval. So look at what they have. They have a, um, a Facebook page where they post a lot of their studies. We post a lot of their studies. Get in touch with their study coordinators. Get on their kind of mailing list and um, participate in studies. It's really a lot of fun. My son said he wants to do that. It's great. He wants to go to Washington and be an advocate. Like he wants to do all of that. <laughs> so it's another way to shake it up. You know, when yeah. um, Katie did the um, the low glucose suspend study, um, and uh, that was a, not a three month study, uh, and she was paid well for it. And um, in her fifteen year old life, right. um, but it, it made her pay attention to her diabetes in a way for three months that she hadn't been paying before. So it just reinvigorates, rededicates you to your management. Yeah. Really it's a new toy, right? It's yeah. A, it's a new yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you're on the cutting edge, and yeah. you get to hang out with these cool doctors and be in touch with them and, and the research assistants and stuff, and you get to hang out with really cool people and be, you know, use the cutting edge toys, and it's, it's fun. My daughter participated in an overnight study last year in a, in a hotel three nights and four days in a hotel with a closed loop system. I mean, it didn't work. It was a mess, but I mean, not because of the device, because of, you know, Bluetooth connectivity stuff, but she had a great time, you know, and she got to try out this really cool device. So, and got paid really well in her 15 year old life. And tomorrow gets a sleep. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> so, I'm not gonna go through this, because you know, but so, so often people who um, are moving from shots to pumps don't realize that the language changes. There's a whole shift in language from, you know, fast acting to, to um, fast acting to insulin. All of a sudden, you're talking about bullocine, and long acting. All of a sudden, you're talking about basal's. So there's a shift, and you stop using long acting insulin. The lamp just kind of goes away, which all of a sudden people don't realize that the pump there's only room for one insulin type. There's you don't use two anymore. So there's a whole shift in language that happens when you go. Um, so you need to realize that. Um, Mealtime bolus is now called bullet. Mealtime insulin is now called bolus. Um, so be aware of that and make sure that when you're being trained, you ask them and ask again if that isn't clear to you. Don't let them just kind of use the jargon and run ahead if you're not clear on that information because it's really, really important. Um, I know we use it all the time and we don't even think about it and then we have to step back and say, oh, you're not on a pump, so you don't know what a bullet is or you don't know what basal rates are because you've been using lantus. So, um, and there's options of different insulins and some work better for different people and some work better in pumps than other insulins. So again, just because you're prescribed one insulin in diagnosis doesn't mean that's the best insulin for you once you're on a pump. Ask questions, you know. There might be different, ins they'll tell you they're exactly the same, but different insulins work differently for different people and different insulins work differently in syringes and in pens than they do in pumps. So just be aware of that, that there are options and different things can work differently. So, so what was your experience for the potential differences with the Humalog or Novolog? So for us, Novolog works much better at the pump than Humalog. When shots, both of them work equally well. Um, Humalog tended to 
to crystallize in the cannula, so the part that's in your body and sits there kind of for three days, um, it crystallizes, and therefore she would get high blood sugars on the th third day of every infusion site. And it was pretty consistent. And they were like, well, change your site every two days. And I was like, I don't want to change your site every two days. Like, really? I don't want to have to do that. Certainly change my insulin, insulin. At once. Right. And we changed our insulin, and voila. We can get use an infusion site for three days. And yeah. So, you know. And sometimes insurances don't like to cover Novolog because they all have a, a contract with Lini and they get Lini Humalog much cheaper than Novolog. And sometimes there's no choice and sometimes you can fight the insurance and sometimes your doctor will say, well, but they're the same, you know, pharmacologically they're exactly the same. And you're like, great, well, if they're exactly the same, give me Novolog. You know, so I'm just saying, ask the questions. Be, know that, and some people use Humalog and it's and they switch them to Novolog, they, and their insurance switches them to Novolog, and it's a disaster. And all of a sudden, they're high, and they want to go back to Humalog. So it's not, there isn't one answer for everyone. But just know that if you, all of a sudden you go on a pump, and your blood sugars were fine on syringes, and you go on a pump, and everything's gone haywire, part of it could be the settings, and part of it could, could be that the insulin isn't working for you in the pump. Ask questions. Could it be the insulin? Maybe we need to switch insulin. A PEDRA is another insulin, which I did, it's considered more fast acting than Novolog or Humalog. So if you do stay on shots or pen, well, pens, I don't think there's an a PEDRA pen. But if you stay on syringes, you could ask to try a PEDRA. A PEDRA has a no copay program. Um, one of the things I'm often asked about is how do you get <coughs> a stockpile of supplies? One of the ways to do that is to look for these programs that give you free supplies or things like that. Apedra has had a no copay a Pedra program for about three years. It was a six month program. It lasts, it's been going on for at least three years where you get a free vial of Apedra every month. Wonderful. So recently I learned that Apedra is not as good in pumps because it crystallizes. But hey, if I've got to carry an extra vial with me when I'm traveling and I just need to carry some extra vials with me, I'll take a Pedra because if I have to go on shots all of a sudden, I don't care if it's a Pedra, if I have to put it in the pump and throw the reservoir away or the change, you know, my site more often because my vial of Novolog broke, I'll use a Pedra, but it's free. And I've got a ton of it because I'm getting a vial a month for free. It doesn't go through my insurance. No one knows about it. It's wonderful. I'll take it. If my friend runs out of insulin, here's a vial of a Pedra. I don't care. Right? So look into these things. Again, they'll be on the handout, but that's one way to get kind of a little cushion of Because we were given a Pedra in the hospital. And then our endocrinologist said, why did you get a Pedra and not Humalog? And I went, why are you asking me Maybe why? Like, I, I don't know anything here, you know? Like, <laughs> so then they, she switched us to Humalog. But like, why? It was two days after the day. I was like, right. why? <laughs> and I should know why like, I got a Pedra in the hospital. I haven't slept for 48 Probably hours. because they're you know, getting like, no copay of Pedra. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a great way. I mean, I have literally been getting a, a vial of a Pedro a month for two and a half years. They just stopped me. And I, I mean, probably if I tried, I could keep going, but it's like, whatever. The other thing you should know is that Novolog has a program where your first um, prescription from them is $25 copay, and your second is $20 copay. So again, even though you're on a pump, you should always be getting a long-acting insulin. You should always have either Levomir or Lantris in case your pump stops working, so you can go back on the shots. Um, so we get, our, our co-pays otherwise are very expensive. You may have a $10 copay and then $20 doesn't sound that exciting. But um, Novolog does have this program where you never pay more than $45 a month for your two insulins if you're getting Lantus, uh, Levomir, and Novolog. So again, that's a great way to save money if your co-pays are higher than that. Um, and we get Levomir every month, even though I don't need it, because all I pay for it is 20 bucks, and I get five um, pens of Levomir. So if anyone ever needs Levomir, I've got a refrigerator full of it. Um, so ostensibly, a Pedra is more fast acting than Humalog or Novolog. You know, that's what they've shown in studies. So if you stay on syringes, you may want to try a Pedra. It may be better for you than Humalog or Novolog. I don't know, but you know, go ahead and try it. My daughter has used it when she's gone on pump occasions, but we're not scientific enough to bother to write it all down and see that it really makes a difference because there's so many other variables that 
I don't know that it would, you know, but that's one thing that would make a difference. Um, so that's about the insulins. And again, when you're getting the tr pump training, ask questions. And um, I'll mention something to you afterwards with the um, Medtronic that can't happen with the diesel. It just happened to a friend, so now I know to warn people about it. Um, I'm not going to talk you all know how to calculate your carb ratios. Um, one thing I always have a hard time with is when people say, oh, increase your insulin to carb ratio or decrease your insulin to carb ratio. I never know what the increase means give more, that will result in more insulin or less insulin. So once a diabetes educator says stronger or weaker, and stronger means more insulin or weaker means less insulin. So I've used that. Um, and to me, that's a lot clearer than increase or decrease. But again, when, you're in, when your diabetes educators give you, oh, you know, increase your insulin to carb ratio, make sure you understand what that means. Don't let them just use jargon on you and move on. And make sure you understand what those words mean. So, and if you, you know, need to like play dumb and ask the stupid questions, don't hesitate to do that. Um, everyone knows about com carb counting? There's a great app called Figwe if you're on iPhone. Um, it costs $2, but it's really great because you can take a picture. It, you don't take a picture. It shows you a picture of the food, and then it's got like a, what do you call that? Barcode? Like a bar. It's not a barcode, but it's like For a quantity? scroll. What? For quantity? Yeah, you just move it up, and oh, it sure, shows like sure. more. Oh, okay. Have you, have you? F I G W E. <laughs> Sorry, I hope you didn't develop it. <laughs> 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 what? Fig weed. Fig weed. But it's a really cool app. I mean, for us, French fries is always the hardest thing. Like, how do you know how much is in French fries? But it shows you a picture, and then you can move the bar up or down, and it, you know, or a bowl of melon or anything, and it just shows you the bowl and things, and you can kind of eyeball compared to what you're eating, and it'll show you, Super you know. Helpful. So it's a really cool app. I mean, there's so many carb counting apps and things, but that one I think is especially easy for people to <coughs> see. Cereal's hard for us. Cereal's a killer. No one should eat yeah. cereal. Yeah. <laughs> Not even healthy people should yeah. be eating cereal. I don't know where you get your care, but Barry Conrad, who's the CDE at Stanford, once said, no one should be eating whole cereal. That's poison. <laughs> so that's poison. sort of been our philosophy ever since. We never really ate a lot of it before, but it's it'll spike your blood sugar to 400 like before you even take it out of the box. It's like, it's, it's. Well ours, I think we've been giving too much insulin for him. So oh. it goes low. He goes low. Yeah. It's Go hard to it. calculate it. No, well, you use a cup. Well, I know, but cup. I don't know, like, I don't know. So what, what worked best for me personally is always to use a small uh, um, scale. So we have a yeah, small we always have. But we scale. have that. And I, I, I never understand the cups and stuff. I don't know. Oh. Is, it, is it a full cup? Is, do I need yeah, because in Cheerios, there's a lot of air in yeah. a cup, right? Does I, it I mean like. So I, I weigh everything. You weigh. Okay. Yeah, we. Yeah. You know, my husband weighs, and I'm like, whatever. And my daughter gets really annoyed at him. He's like, it's fine, it's fine. I know how much it is. Because I'm really, after six years, she really can eyeball most things. But yeah. he's like, that's way the mango. Yeah. That's way the and there's oh, no. <laughs> here it's yeah. 19 grams. So another thing, my daughter will only enter carbs in odd numbers into her pump. So every carb number she puts into her pump is an odd number. Why? It works for her. It works for her. <laughs> Sharon's looking at me like, why? why? <laughs> and I know people who always round up, so it's always got to be like 60 or 30 or 40. Yeah. Why? because they've been living with it and they need to do it their way. But that's how she does it. And she'll yell at me in the middle of the night if like I'm giving her, you know, stuff for lows and I need to pull it. She's like, is it an odd number? And I'm like, yes, Tia, it's an odd number. I, I've been doing this long enough that I know I need to enter an odd number. But yeah, all odd numbers. Well, you kind of you kind of learn too. So if something's 32 carbs, it's like, so do you do two units or three units if you're on one to 15? And so right. it, it depends on what the food is and how you react. Right. 
And I remember I was in a, we were at a yoga place and I saw a type one we know and I was like, so how much do you bullet for this? He said, well, if I'm running high, I'll do 45. And if I'm running low, I said, it's 35 grams of carbs. So carb counting is really. That's what we've been doing actually lately. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, you're low, let's just eat. <laughs> right. So it's all, you know, it's nothing about carb counting is scientific. So, I mean, when you've got a granola bar, Right, that's kind of easy easier. to But when gauge. you have a thing of frozen yogurt, you know. By the way, we've sort of discovered that an ounce of frozen yogurt is eight grams of carbs. Mm -hmm. With toppings and everything. That's kind of how we've done it. So, that's just our calculation. So. You can check me on that, Sunit. <laughs> But that's all in, but it's not about you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know how to, again, this is if you were calculating, you can skip through this. Um, diabetes and exercise. People have said that um, exercise with diabetes is probably the second hardest thing other than pregnancy with diabetes. So since we're not talking about pregnancy and diabetes, um, we can talk about exercise. We have whole talks about this, and I'm really not a doctor, and I'm not going to give you, you know, the medical advice, but it's check early and often. You, like, have to get used to checking early and in between and, you know, figuring out how it works for you. Um, you keep your BG in a safe range, and what a safe range is for you is different for every person, and what a comfortable range is for you to do best at exercise is different for every person. Um, but, you know, there's different devices to carry your low supplies, and make it comfortable, but never exercise without having low supplies nearby. Um, you don't want to get into a, a bad situation when you're exercising, and that's the key. Um, ketones, Does it, how many people here know about ketones? We know about it. You know it. How many people here have blood uh, ketone meters? I know blood. blood? No. So you all have urine yeah. strips? Okay, next time you go to your doctor, ask them about getting a blood keto meter. Um, so the urine strips are great and convenient, and they work. Blood uh, ketones tend to be considered more accurate. Urine, because it takes a while to accumulate in your body, will often give you kind of old information. And same when you, so by the time you find out about ketones, it can be sort of after the fact, and once the ketones are cleared, it can also be kind of, you can find out about it later, because again, it takes time for the urine to accumulate. Blood ketone is just like a finger, it's a finger stick, just like um, a blood sugar check. It's a, you need a little more blood for a ketones check, but not like, you know, you're not, it's not from the vein. Um, and what I like, especially about um, blood ketone meters, is that I can check my daughter at night, so let's say she's high at night and I'm worried, is her sight not working or is something up? I can check her with, you know, the urine, you have to wake the kids and get up to feed, but it's not a pretty sight. Um, so that's really convenient. Um, always talking about traveling, always take a ketone meter when you're traveling because um, undoubtedly when you're traveling, your child will get sick, um, will go high, will something will happen and you'll want to know if they have ketones and that's when you'll realize you haven't brought your ketone meter or ketone urine stick. So always, even if it's, you know, I'm not saying like a date at the city, but any overnight, I would always recommend taking a ketone meter and talk to your doctor about getting it. Precision Extra is currently pretty much the only company that does it. There was one more company, but I'm not sure that they're still in business called NovaCare. Um, the problem, the meters are cheap, like everything, meters are cheap, strips are really expensive. Some co insurance companies cover the strips, some don't. Um, there are ways around it. Um, for the first, do you know about uh, Brave Buddies, Nathan and Sharon? No. Okay, so I'll tell you about that afterwards. It's a Yahoo group for parents of children with type 1 diabetes, so it's a great resource in addition to the adjunct to Carpium. Um, so there are ways to get strips you know, yeah. off market um, for cheap. Um, Obviously, I'm happy to tell you about our resources too. I know someone. You know somebody. Yeah, <laughs> we're dr we're all drug dealers in ours. <laughs> you know, my front porch is constantly. You need some lantus. I got some lantus. Yeah. <laughs> so there are ways to get 
without having to pay for, because those strips are $10 a strip out of pocket. You don't want to be buying these, you know, those strips out of pocket if you can avoid it. People get them and they get more than they need. And, you know, because you can go six months without using ketone strips and then your kid's sick for a week and you're using, you know, you know 10 ketone strips a, uh, in a few days or and all the time. So, you know, there are ways to get it. But you definitely want to have a way to check ketones. Um, and the preferred way is blood, but urine is fine. As long as you have a way to check them, you know when to check them, and you check them when you need to, that's the key. Um, once my daughter was, you know, 350 for a few checks in a row, and we didn't check, and then my doctor said, and you of course check ketones, and I was like, uh, no. So now I always check ketones so that if he ever says that again, I can at least say, yes, we check ketones, and she didn't have them, or she did, or whatever, but at least I can answer him. Um, these are when you check ketones, sick, high, uh, anytime it's an unexplained high blood sugar for a couple of times in a row, we will check ketones. It usually happens in the middle of the night, so it's very convenient to be able to check with them. <coughs> and anytime your child is sick, it's a good way to rule out whether the sickness is because of ketones, and um, if it's not because of ketones, when they're sick, they could develop ketones, and then I'm sure your doctors talk to you about what can happen when there are ketones present, um, but you want to make sure that ketones don't become present, and if they are, then you manage that. And if they haven't spoken to you about it, please ask them about what to do when ketones are present. And again, we have whole talks about sick day management and um, how to deal with ketones. So that's a whole other conversation, but just know that it's something you need to know about and be aware of and know how to treat when it happens. And actually, we have talked about it. And we have, have slides, and slides and presentations. And on that, on blog, yeah. Um, so, and this, this is where um, diabetes moves out of the realm of um, sort of just, you know, carb counting and um, blood sugar management to, you know, healthy mind, healthy body. Um, it's not only healthy first, diabetic second, but it's person first, healthy first, diabetic third. Um, for kids and for adults, um, generally speaking, we want to have a healthy, happy person before we think about just food and blood sugars. And um, I know it's sometimes tempting to say, okay, let's go on a carb-free diet and let's cut out all cakes and let's cut out everything good in life and just manage our blood sugars. Um, I don't know about you, but that certainly wouldn't work for me if I was diagnosed today with type 1 diabetes and that certainly is not gonna work for my daughter since she's diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So it's very, <coughs> very important to, um, to keep the whole child in mind and remember that they are a child or a person before they are, person with diabetes and that whatever food rules apply to the rest of the family should apply to that child and whatever food rules you're now going to apply to that child should apply to the rest of the family and not sort of single them out and like here Johnny have your carrots and we'll all have a carrot cake you know that's not going to work not for the child not for the rest of the family no one's going to be happy with that so think of this as a if you're going to make a change to your eating habits and that's fine um, if your eating habits needed a change you can use this as a you know a, an instigator and a reason to make the change but don't single out the person with diabetes make this a whole family change and um, make sure the whole family is happy with it because otherwise the kid with diabetes will feel that I've just ruined the rest of my family's life I mean my son still thinks I think that we stopped having dessert every day I'm not sure we ever did have dessert every day but he thinks we stopped They'll having claim it what They'll claim it. They'll claim did, it. Yeah. And I think he thinks it's because of diabetes, which I don't think is true anyway. But it's like, you don't want anyone to think that diabetes is the root of all evil in the world, right? Like, you really do not want. And these kids can have enough issues with food that you really do not want to make that relationship even worse. And I know it can be worse for girls, but it can happen with boys as well. So you really want to, it's a very fine line to walk, but you have to really be mindful of not being too restrictive. You know, I just got an email yesterday from a, a senior in high school who was just diagnosed with type one four weeks ago, and she's like, she's trying to decide whether to go to college or put it off for a year. And 
that's a whole other decision. He said, I'm going to really try and get control of it now and um, go on a carb-free diet. So you gotta think of the whole person. So that's what I'm saying. Like, would you rather have that at a birthday party or that at a birthday party? I'm not saying have that every day, but if you gave that at the birthday party, that's the face you're gonna get. So think of this as a whole body, whole family, whole you know person experience, not just what's the best thing for my blood sugars. Because unhappy people don't think happy blood sugars either. So. So the only time that carb-free is recommended is when you're trying to figure out your basal rates. And your doctor, certainly when you go on a pump, they might talk to you about trying to do a basal test. I don't know if they talk to you about that. So it's when you try to be carb-free for a few hours and during that time see what happens to your blood sugars. If they're going up on their own, that means you need more insulin, so increase your basal rates. If they're going down, you need less insulin, so decrease your basal rate. So those are times when you may want to do a, a carb-free time, you know, a few hours overnight, you know, things like that. But not um, all the time. When you're hungry and your BG is high, then you maybe try to offer some carb-free alternative. Sometimes it works. Sometimes my daughter's like, I'm high and I'm going for that Jamba Juice. And it's like, not my choice, but your whole soccer team's going for Jamba Juice now and uh, you'll pull us and you'll come down later. And again, that's when it's child first, diabetes second. Right. And you just kind of have to go to it. Um, and as Melissa was saying, her daughter sometimes shows up in San Francisco with four units of insulin. And that's a good time to try being carb-free for a few hours. You know, if you don't have insulin, it's maybe a time to try to go on veggies for a few hours. But other than that, really, you know, unless it's what you want to do anyway, um, it's not necessarily what you have to do because you have diabetes. Um, so some carb-free snacks if you need them. And again, when you're on um, when you're on shots and you're looking for carb-free snacks because you don't pull this for snacks maybe or don't take a shot for snacks, then you may want some ideas. I don't think you can tell, but I think these are um, seaweed. My daughter and son both love seaweed. Um, jerky nuts, I'm sure you've all seen all of those and our kids are probably tired. and bad numbers, or even good A1Cs and bad A1Cs, and really um, that's kind of a language you should drop right away um, for anyone who's getting started with this, or even as, I mean, we hear doctors still say um, um, finger tests, you know, test your blood sugar, test your, what's your sugar, test your blood sugar. Um, people who have lived with diabetes hate hearing they check their blood sugar, whether they say check or, or test, they feel like they're being tested, and they feel like that number is a score. And they don't want someone else scoring them and giving them a grade every time. And they certainly don't want someone saying, hey, is that a good number or a bad number? Like, they don't need to hear that. Um, so I would say drop that language as soon as you can get it out of your vocabulary. Numbers are just data, they're just information, as the people at camp like to say. The only bad numbers are the ones you don't know. If, it, if you've got a number, you can treat it. You can do something about it. If you don't have it, then you don't have the information to do something about it. So <coughs> try to drop that language. Um, corrections, when a, your blood sugar is high, they some, for some reason use the word correction as if you've made a mistake. You can't stand that. Use adjustment, use any other word, just use bullets. Just use take a shot. If you're high, take a shot, let's get your blood sugar back in range. Um, so there's a whole list of words. We just, again, had a talk about it. <coughs> he brought a whole list of words at the summit. 
Um, that was a good time. Yeah, I thought it was great. He didn't have, um, sorry, I need to get another piece of water. He didn't have corruption in there, so I think he's gonna add it. <coughs> but, um, I cleared up these numbers very quickly. And if there's judgments associated with them that are brought on by the outside, then they're just not gonna wanna check their blood sugar. And that's the worst thing that can happen. And I used to sigh when my daughter was high. I always hated highs more than lows um, for a variety of reasons. And my daughter hated it when I sighed. And finally I learned to just say thank you for checking. And it just gave me an outlet and something to say whenever she checked, and I say it to this day. Every time she checked, I say thank you for checking. Because you know what? She doesn't care what her blood sugar is. 99% of the time, she doesn't care. She's happy to eat without checking. She'll give herself insulin without checking. She doesn't care. I want to know what her blood sugar is. And I say thank you for checking, and I never sigh. Not when she's high, not when she's low. We just treat and move on. And it's way better, because if she, I keep sighing every time she's high, She's just not gonna tell me. And you go to camp and you ask seven counselors there if they've lied about their blood sugar, 99% of them will tell you they've lied to their parents about their blood sugars. And you don't wanna get to that point with your kids. You don't want them lying to you. You don't want them um, falsifying their numbers and their meter. They now are clever enough to falsify their CGMs. So you just don't want that. Yes? Um, I, I'm thinking of a head. Yes. And like, I know we there's a, a teenager that my son's close to that he's on the pump and like you're checking your daughter at night you were saying how you're sleep deprived and everything like that <coughs> when is that gonna stop when is she gonna as an adult like there's a couple people here that are type one and they're adults do they check themselves at night to see if they're high like do they wake up in the middle of the night and check themselves as an adult you get up to go to the bathroom <laughs> And you feel bad or something? No, I even you don't necessarily you don't necessarily feel high. Right. <coughs> you feel. I mean, some people don't feel low, or sometimes I feel the same with our high or low. So I don't know. Again, the checking is, um, you know, it's a little bit. I, as a as a as a parent, I I think it would be a little bit more worrisome for me. Right. You know, because right. it's my child versus myself. You, for sure. I, so I get that. Yeah. So that's kind of at least where I am with it. But like your daughter's 15, like are you gonna do that while she's still in the house with you until she goes to off to college? Um, so it really varies from person to person. Are you getting up and checking at night? We're not sleeping. You're not sleeping. sleeping. Because of baby or because, because of, of baby? everything. <laughs> baby and the type one. I'm, I'm, we have an alarm, three a.m. So I check for the alarm, I check, I check the alarm, I check after the alarm. Did the alarm work? So you the are checking works. though at night though. You are checking. Yeah, we're just uh, we're we're not sleeping at all. And now yeah. we have the. Um, but we have the Dexcom. We have the Dexcom. And with that, so I think it's half of what was there in the previous couple of slides goes away when you see it continually. Here we we can see that uh, now. But we also have they they our, just. Okay. Added our, this thing yeah. with the iPhone devices and iPads and stuff okay. that you can. Try. But it doesn't matter. It, it just, uh, we don't sleep. I so, sure. it's funny. So, so she's a lot seven, of people, though. Yeah. Like, her daughter's 15. Like, when is it? A seven, I can almost understand why you're not sleeping. But, like, 15. So, my daughter doesn't feel her lows at night. So, uh, is she 45 now? No. Yeah, my daughter she, was 45. You have a service night. dog, though, right? Right. Or the no? service dog also but sleeps at night. Sleep. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 That's what my mom said today. Maybe we should get a dog because I was talking about your dog. And <laughs> Again, yeah, so you don't need a dog. You have a baby, and no, don't yeah, get a dog. You don't need a dog. Right now. But so there's a, there's a few things. So first of all, there are some adults who get up. Some adults feel their lows. Some adults will get up and check their blood sugar. They've been doing it for years. They get up. They don't even have to set an alarm. Some adults, their spouses will feel that they're wet and sweaty when they're low. They'll wake them up. Some adults don't run themselves a little higher at night. So they just set their, That's their, what we've been doing. their target at night. And with the pump, you can do it. They set their target a little higher at night and they just sleep through the night. It's a lifestyle choice. Okay. Um, adults who are diagnosed later usually have a longer honeymoon. They right. usually don't have as much variability. I'm saying usually, I don't know what's going on for you. I don't want to make, you know, 
So it's very different when you're diagnosed later in life and when you're diagnosed younger. My daughter doesn't feel her lows, she doesn't feel highs, um, day or night, she doesn't feel highs. And she doesn't feel her lows at night. She's also very active, you know, so yesterday was, you know, soccer and lacrosse. Okay. So when she's really active, does she feel her lows during the day? Sometimes. Sometimes. You know, but sometimes she can feel at 60. Why didn't she feel it at 80? Right. Right. She was busy running around and didn't right. notice it. Why did she feel at 70? I don't know. Um, you know, everyone's different. A lot of people don't check when their kids are on shots and then they move on to a pump and all of a sudden it, you can, will you now give your child a shot at 150? For, if his target's 120, would you give him a shot at 150? We do. Um, at night? We haven't given him a shot because I would he never hasn't been high enough. Right, and I, when my daughter was on shots, I probably wouldn't give her a shot at 250 either because right. like, it was in the middle of the night. Right, That's but now she's on a check. pump. I can give her a shot at, uh, I can give her insulin at 140. Why not, <laughs> right? Like, you can, so why not climb the Everest? It's there, right? So you can do it. I'm not saying I will get up at 2 a.m. to give her insulin because she's 140, but you have the tools to have better management. You become a little maybe, you know, I'm just saying, you've got the tools, you want to use them, maybe. You have to decide what you want to do. Because um, we're in shots now, we have the Lantus now, so while he's sleeping, he still has insulin. He's also on honeymoon. But yeah, but here with the pump, He's not getting that. Right, he's so getting insulin like, every five yeah. minutes. Okay. He's getting, yeah. so basal rates is a drip of insulin every five okay. minutes okay, 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 okay. to mimic what his body is doing. Right. It's a little drip of insulin every five minutes. And the doctors will adjust it so that between like midnight and four when your body typically gives you more insulin because you have growth hormones for a growing 14 year old, for he'll sure. get more and then it'll come down at 4 a.m. and then go up at six because in the morning they're more insulin resistant. So he'll have 12 basal rates, for example, because you can do that with a pump, right? You can't do that with lattice. You get a shot at sure. seven in the morning, maybe it. a shot at seven at night, or maybe just one shot, you know? So you have cruder tools, which sometimes means more sleep. It's right. not always, <coughs> you know, so I'm not saying I don't get up at four, I don't get up to give her a shot at 140. I couldn't care less if she's 140, I would sleep. But if she's 340, I will get up and give her insulin. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and you know, when she was on shots, she will only give herself shots. I can't give her a shot. I have to shake her to wake her, draw, here, give yourself a shot. Mm -hmm. So you know, even at 250, I'd be like, whatever, we'll take care of it in the morning. Like, really, am I going to now go right, through right, all right. that? Maybe not. So it's a, it's a lifestyle choice. And it depends what's happening for your kid. If your kid's not an athlete and not going low at night and not going high at night, sleep. For sure. Amen. But my daughter doesn't feel her lows. I mean, she sleeps right through a 45. Yeah, he would too. He feels them during the day, but not, he wouldn't at night. But then, too, without the CGM, you don't really you know, know right. if you're going to or not or not. Exactly. So that's, that's, that's why I'm like, okay, eat too. a handful of pretzels before going to bed. You know, like. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if I can skip this. You don't need to see a day in the life of a diabetic. Um, that was today. And it'll be yeah, tomorrow. that was every day. <laughs> okay, it'll be the next <laughs> day. We all live it. <laughs> so you're all familiar with it. It's a very heavy type two focus, but it also does programs for type ones. Um, Behavioral Diabe Diabetes Institute focuses mainly on the psychosocial aspect of type 1 diabetes. They've got a lot of online resources. Um, of course, Part DM. <coughs> Diabetes Hands Foundation is based in Berkeley, great organization. Um, and they have online communities to diabetes. is a huge online community. Um, BYF is right here out of Concord. They do amazing camps for kids with type 1 diabetes and families. Highly recommended teen camp for your son. Um, great camps, family camps. I, probably not a kids camp yet, but great family camps. Um, no adult camps. Sorry. And then JDRF. Sorry. You're probably all familiar yeah. with. I want to go to camp. Um, I know, right? Again, they do. A, they do a lot. Their main focus is fundraising for research for 
cure and better treatments for type 1 diabetes, but they also do great programs and they actually have a one day um, kind of mini summit coming up on June 28th at Santa Clara University. So if you're around, um, that's a great program. Yeah. JDR also does like youth ambassadors. Yeah, we yeah. I signed up for that yeah. already. Yeah. So yeah, the yeah. advocates and stuff. But they already have a team already going this summer. Right, to the and then they do it every other year. Other year. So but we're then hoping we have sixteen. Do things locally mm -hmm. in Sacramento, or yeah, no, no, they no. Do within your community. Local. Oh, okay. Meet yeah. with meet with local uh, representatives and mentor kids and do all kinds of things. Yeah, because we got the we got the email about the passing the law passing for right. the next two years yeah. getting funding. Yeah, the promise. Kids. Yeah, the special diabetes program. Yeah, and did everyone? Did everyone? Did the two children in the room get the bag of hope? You yeah. I, yeah. I didn't get it. Okay, so but we saw it, and it's it's good. Really? Everyone needs a root trip. Okay. Everyone needs a root trip. She loved it. Trust me. Everyone. Needs but a yours root was root younger. Root. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Everyone needs a root trip. All right. I have a question. Different yes. question. Uh, we would like to go to leave <laughs> for a few days. Oh no. I'm just so we just um, the babysit. You, you have their uh, babysitters. Mm -hmm. um, are they good? How much? How much? You know, AES they're good. Okay. I, and I can talk to you about specific ones, like who we've had, or I, I can recommend for overnights, Overnight, or you know, yeah. and stuff. Yeah, everything's informative right now. Yeah. <laughs> so do you want to ask specific questions? Okay, so here's my traveling kind of spiel. You want to take lots of supplies and then double it. So basically, if you're checking 10 times a day, you take, 10, you take enough supplies for 10 strips a day, then double that, and then take once more that. Like, so, like you want to take strips for 30 checks a day. Okay. You check, take, anything you take, you take from multiple lots. I was telling you before. Because if there is a recall on any of your supplies on a certain lot, and this has happened to us, and they recall a lot, and everything you took is from that lot, you're screwed. <laughs> so I, whether I don't know what that is, a lot. So like, this water was produced, everything you buy has got a production number and a lot number, that uh, it was all produced in a lot. I didn't good. know what it was, but like, uh, what's a lot number? Do you know what it is? Can we? No. Here, let me grab a thing of strips. strips. Do you have test strips? Perfect. Like anything made with from that company on a certain date and time. Right, and it's all made here. Thank you. It's like when they recall food and stuff. Yeah. It's that. Okay. Yeah, when they recall beef or right. certain styles of Can you see a lot number on this? Here, lot. That's okay. the lot number, and that's, that's probably the lot number. number. So they will recall. Thank you. Oh, here. You see, lot number, yeah. that, yeah. you know what a lot number yeah. is? And your strips have it, your infusion sets have it, thank you. Um, How do you find out whether there's a recall of that? Um, they'll, Facebook, internet, I mean if you're a pump company client, you'll get a letter, that's another thing, they send you a mail letter. Right. The, that's by now they might also do email, back then they sent a letter, but like you Brave Buddies, once again, Brave Buddies is a great resource. Um, you find out. That's the least of your problems. The problem is, what do you do when you're away for a month and right. all your strips are from one lot? And you know, sometimes you're in a country where they have the same strips and you can get them maybe. But first of all, it's a huge hassle, doctor, prescription, whatever. Sometimes you're in a country where they don't even have those strips or pumps or whatever. So always take a mixture of different lot numbers. Really important. Because um, that did happen to us our first summer when we traveled. Um, for infusion sites, the recommendation is one a day. So if you change your site every three days and you're going for 30 days, you take 30 infusion sites. One a day. That's the recommendation. Why is that? Because they fall off, you sweat, you. That's the recommendation. Um, and we always do. I mean, we went to Boston for 10 days, I took 10 infusion sites. You come back with nine of them, great. But you wanna have 10. 
you take all your supplies and your carry-ons. Nothing gets shipped. And you're allowed to have an extra carry-on. Your TSA rules, airline rules are that you're allowed an extra carry-on for medical supplies. Okay. So that's very important to know. Most pump co companies, I don't know about Panda, but check, will give you a loaner pump. So if you're going, if you're going out of the U.S., for example, in the U.S., they'll ship you a new pump anywhere within 24 hours, usually. Mm -hmm. But even so, if you're going for a lot, you don't want to deal with it, you can get a loaner pump. But certainly if you're traveling abroad, you can take a loaner pump. For I know the deal with Medtronic, usually you get it for 90 days. They send you a pre-self-addressed you know, pre self -addressed stamped envelope to send it back. Um, I think it's $50 for the whole process. You get the pump, you take it with you, send it back when you get home. Hopefully you never needed it. If you needed it, it's right there. Always print out your pump settings, your basal rates, your insulin to carb ratio, your insulin sensitivity factor, always print it out. Because when your pump dies, chances are it'll be dead and you won't have that information. So print it out. And you may not have access to the internet where you can get to see all of that. Print out a hard copy of all your pump settings. Take a picture of it on your phone, whatever you like. Have a, have a copy of all your settings so that you can, I've gotten calls from Hawaii. My pump died and I don't know my settings. How am I gonna find it out? And of course it's the weekend and you can't get through to your doctor. And you know, everything always happens at the least convenient times. Again, make sure you have your ketone meter with you. Um, there is no problem getting through security with insulin. There's no prob problem getting through security with syringes. There is no problem with meters. You do not want your pumps to go through the x-ray machines. So if you have an extra uh, pump, don't just put that in the carry-on and set that and walk through with yours. Check with your pump company what can go through the metal detectors and what can go through the machines. Most pumps can't go through the machines. Kids don't go through the machines, so it's not an issue. 14-year-olds will go through those machines. Um, check. The Medtronic cannot go through that machine. It has to go through a metal detector or has to be body pump, body. Um, with a wand? With a wand and a body yeah. pack. So they can't go through it, they're not supposed to, it would hurt it or? It will hurt it. Okay. It'll okay. mess it up. Okay. Similarly, it can't go, can't be by x-ray machine. So if he's getting teeth x-rays, hand x-rays, any kind of x-ray MRI, pump should be outside of the room. Disconnect, okay. move know. outside yeah. of the room. Okay. Same goes for the, the, um, I, be, I believe the CGM receiver. I think the transmitter can stay on, but yeah, I don't think we're getting the CGM okay. receiver for that. Okay. Well, that doesn't have a CGM receiver. That's the pump. Okay. But I don't know about the Dexcom. You would know better. But check with the company. Um, but Medtronic definitely, and I'm assuming Tandem as well, the pump cannot go through the x ray yeah, machine. Um, and that includes teeth and other x-ray machines, not just airport x-ray machines. Um, insulin, I didn't mention the Frio packs, but um, to travel with insulin, you know, insulin can be at room temperature um, once you've started using it. And for your extra insulin, I mean, if you wanna take a cooler and all that, go for it. I mean, certainly if you're doing a road trip, that you can do. I would, I, if you're going into a hotel room, Unless it's a full-size, sort of reliable-looking fridge, I would never put my insulin into one of those small little refrigerators. Close to the freezer. More, yeah, you have a much better chance of it freezing your insulin than actually keeping it cold and doing what it needs. So I would really avoid those refrigerators. You're much better off, um, there's something called Frio packs. Have you heard of those? So, yeah. So you get Frio packs, it's this thing, it comes flat and it's got those gel balls in it and you put it in water and it fills up with water and then it'll keep your insulin sort of at room temperature or a good comfortable temperature. So if it's really hot outside, it'll keep it from baking um, and if it's really cold, it'll keep it from freezing. It's not gonna refrigerate it, it won't cool it, but it kind of keeps it at a good steady temperature. So, you know, if you travel, I mean, you may come home and if you haven't used it, you may not want to then use that insulin. You kind of may have to throw it out. But if you're traveling for a month and you need to use it during that month, it's perfectly fine. 
Um, but I don't know that I would come home and put it in the fridge and say, okay, I can use that in three months and it's still good for a month after that. I probably wouldn't do that. Um, obviously, if you're going to someone's house and putting the insulin in, that's fine. Um, uh, ironically, the biggest trouble we've had traveling has been with juice boxes. So I would just like forget the juice boxes, go in through security, just, I mean, unless that's the absolute only thing your child will, or you will have for a low, just forget it, just like not forget it. Um, you know, there's other low things you can use. Um, strips, pump supplies, insulin, ketone meter, ketone meter, ketone meter. Um, what else? Oh, adjusting yeah. your basal rates and time change. So time changes wreaks havoc on your body anyway, right? You're eating at weird times, you're sleeping at weird times, your basal rates are all messed up. Talk to your doctor about how best to adjust it. Everyone's got their own sort of way of doing it. Um, some people say we start doing it a few days before even and moving it a couple hours at a time. Some people say, you know, just do it all at once, you know, just tear off the band-aid, switch the time and it'll all be okay. Some people say, you know, again, do it a few hours at a time and after you get there, keep switching it all, uh, uh, you know, a few more, over the course of a few more days as you get there. Um, one thing to remember about vacation is if here you're getting up at 7 a.m. and going to school and having breakfast at 7 a.m. and everything's adjusted to sort of a 7 a.m. start of the day, because um, that's when you're most insulin resistant and that's when you're eating your breakfast. All of a sudden you're on vacation, you're getting up at 9 a.m. and having breakfast at 10 a.m. Well, by then your basal rates are a totally different setting because they're for 10 a.m. when you're less insulin resistant and you're, it's, you know, it's when you're at school and you don't want to go low, so your basal rates may have dropped and your insulin to carb ratio may have changed. You have to shift all of that, not just for time change, but also for vacation time. And that's true for whether you're staying home or, or traveling anywhere. You want to make sure that if your child's sort of day shifts over vacation, your basal rates and insulin to carb ratios all shifts as well. Because when Tia wakes up on the weekend at 11 and has breakfast at 12, well, her insulin to carb ratio for lunch is 1 to 20, and her insulin to carb ratio for breakfast is 1 to 8. So if she goes and has breakfast at noon and is still having the same waffles and syrup, she's getting half as much insulin but her body is still insulin resistant and it's still a whole lot of carbs, she needs to double her insulin intake. So on vacation, when she does that every day, she's gonna be high all the time. So you need to think about that. Like when we just went back east, I never changed the time on her pump because I actually, her, our whole day shifted by three hours, our whole schedule. So you need to take that into account when changing the time is also to shift the whole schedule to whatever your vacation schedule is. Now, if she stays getting up at 7 a.m., then you want to do the full time change. Um, so that's really important. And Dr. Adi is going to be here in May, and he talks a lot about basal rates and um, adjusting for time. He can talk about adjusting them both for vacation and time of okay. travel. So that's a great talk to come to. Um, what else about travel? Um, in general, when you're on vacation, I don't know how many of you have been on vacation, you started <laughs> diabetes on vacation, on vacation. <laughs> um, but blood sugars will be crazy on vacation you're eating differently you're exercising differently you're you're less focused on your child with diabetes when on vacation and somehow blood sugars are always high on vacation and just kind of again sigh breathe and let it go and don't let that ruin your vacation or your child and again i would say if it's time for everyone to go out for ice cream and your child is 270 go out for ice cream and you know if you can get them to check ahead of time and start bolusing ahead of time great but don't let diabetes ruin your vacation because they'll remember that a lot more than anything else so keep that in mind what else can I tell you about vacation um, heat will cook your insulin so if you are in Israel in August um, there are Frio packs for pumps I don't know if you want to put yeah, for we, pumps we don't want but you may, you need to be aware that um, you may need to change her insulin in the reservoir more often. Um, you know, if she isn't, if the pump isn't being cooled all the time. So some people will do that. They'll change the insulin every day or every couple of days because the first summer in, in Israel was like that. The insulin was just getting cooked. And 
again, this is our experience, but Humalog, Humalog is less um, robust than Novolog and won't hold up as well to heat than Novolog will. So if you are on Humalog, you may want to look into changing. We're actually on Novolog. You're Novolog, so that's good. Of course, it'll probably get cooked in what's in that container. Terrible. Um, what? And she's just high yeah, okay. all the time. And it was, I think, only like three weeks later, they'd be like, oh, it was probably getting cooked. You know, <laughs> it's not like, oh, we immediately knew it and knew what to do. We were also dealing with a lot of AP for all that time. And it was our first summer with diabetes and all that. Um, you know, definitely check and see if your scripts are sold in Israel. Insulin is usually sold every, you know, most of them. But again, insulin here is U100. That means the strength is. 100, whatever that means, I don't exactly remember. In other places, it could be U300, U500, so if you have to get insulin somewhere else, make sure that the strength is something you understand.